Our topic for today, our subject is the, the beauty of God-given roles. And by role, we mean the, the functions, the activities, the responsibilities that are assigned to us or expected of us in different areas of our life. Uh, now, I can't just ask you what is your God-given role in life because different roles in different areas of our lives. Uh, you have different roles in your family and in your church, in your work, in government, in different organizations or activities that you could, that you're involved with. And I could go on and on. We all have numerous roles in different areas of our lives and our Christian life touches every one of them. So as we begin to think of this, uh, the beauty of God-given roles, I want to begin our study by looking at Christ. I want to be look, look at our, our Lord himself. The goal of our Christian life is to be like Christ. In fact, we are predestined to be conformed to his image. And so what can we learn from our Lord himself? So I want you to turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Now, the subject of this chapter is the inadequacies of Old Testament sacrifices. Um, it, says, uh, it says in verse, in verse uh, 1 that uh, the Old Testament sacrifices really could not take away sin. Uh, that uh, those sacrifices are the same sacrifices continually offered every year they cannot make perfect those who draw near. Then in verse four, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And so what this chapter is talking about is the fact that while these sacrifices could not take away our sin, they did point to the perfect sacrifice of Christ, which did satisfy God's holy requirements and his sacrifice did take away our sin. So, in verses five to seven, the writer of Hebrews quotes three different verses from Psalm 40 to show us why Christ offered himself, why he made this sacrifice. And I think that this is a key passage when we look at the subject of a person's role. And we want to think about our savior as he, uh, as he came to save us from sin. Uh, his role in the Godhead. So notice as we, uh, as we look at these, at these verses, um, it says in verse five, uh, when he comes into the world. So these verses take us back to the time of the incarnation. Uh, this is when the Lord Jesus left the presence of God to come into this world. And here he is speaking to the Father. Now, we all know that Christ did not begin to exist when he was born as a baby. He is God's eternal son. So here the son is speaking with the Father, and he is saying why he came into the world. So look at verses 5 to 7. Now, I want to read these verses, but notice that there is an alternation. We go back and forth between the fact that animal sacrifices really could not satisfy God. And then Christ expresses why he really did come into the world. So first of all, it says uh, concerning sacrifices. Sacrifice and offering you have not desired. And then Christ says, but a body you have prepared for me. And then it speaks about sacrifices again. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. And then Christ says, then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Then verses 8 to 10 are a comment on this. Uh, it says, after saying above sacrifices and offerings, and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, 
you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So these verses are saying that when Christ came to do the Father's will, he came to present the perfect sacrifice. He came to really take away sin. But to do that, he had to die. He came to die. And that was the Father's will for him. By his death, our sins were dealt with so that we sinners could come to, to God. Now, this, this passage tells us something about God's plan of redemption. We're, we're looking back uh, before the incarnation, and we have the veil taken away a little bit for us, and we see the conversation that takes place between the Father and the Son. And the son says, I have come to do your will. The will that the son came to fulfill was the father's will. And so the plan, the plan of salvation, the plan of redemption was the father's plan. God was the originator. He was the designer, the determiner of the plan of redemption. The father was the one who planned our salvation. The father sent the son. And the son came to execute the father's plan. And we see here that there's an order in the Godhead in the plan of redemption. The father is the head. The son is the servant. And the son says in verse 7, I have come to do your will, O God. I have come to do your will. Now think about that. Who is saying this? This is the son. This is the son of God from all eternity. This is the one who himself is fully God. Yet he voluntarily submits himself to do the will of the father. So he's referring to the time when he came into the world, I have come to do your will, O God. Now, this was not only true when he came into the world. This was true of his whole time here on earth. In John 5, 30, Jesus said, I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And his submission even took him to the cross. Philippians 2, 7 says he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. I have come to do your will. What was God's will for Christ? Not just to come into the world, not just to humble himself and become a man, not just to teach men and to perform miracles. God's will for his was for him to go to the cross, to die, not just an ordinary death. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. He cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So what I want us to see here is that there are different roles in the Godhead. And we see that particularly in the areas of creation and redemption. The different persons of the Trinity have different roles, different functions, different primary activities. In creation, in creation, God the Father spoke to bring the created universe into existence. But it was God the Son who carried out the de creative decree. John 1 says, all things came into being through him. And from apart from him, not even one thing came into being which has come into being. And the Holy Spirit also was involved in creation. Genesis 1 says that the, Holy, that the Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. So we see different roles in creation. And in redemption, 
God the Father is the author and planner of the divine plan of redemption. Uh, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The Son said, I have come to do your will, O God. The Son obeyed and submitted to the will of the Father. The Father didn't die for our sins. The Son did. Every once in a while, we'll have a uh, little heresy in our assembly at the Lord's Supper. Uh, someone will begin to pray, Father, we have come to worship you. Thank you, God, for dying for our sins. But it wasn't the Father. It was the Son who died for our sins. And most of us recognize that. And if you ask the person who had just said, uh, thank you, God, for dying for our sins, uh, he would say, oh, that's what I meant. I meant the son. <laughs> In fact, Dave Glock used to say when a person thanked God for dying his, for his sins, uh, the father in heaven would turn to the son and say, uh, he means you. <laughs> so uh, the Holy Spirit also has a distinct role in the plan of redemption. He applies the work of the son on the cross. Uh, he convicts of sin, he regenerates, he sanctifies, he empowers. So each member of the Trinity has a different role in the pan, plan of redemption. So here there are two points that are particularly important to emphasize as we are going to look at what our roles are in our, different, in our lives. So let me particularly look at the Father and the Son First of all, we need to recognize that there is a complete equality between the Father and the Son. Both are equally God. The Father and the Son are both fully God. Uh, they are equal in nature. They are equal in attributes. They are equal in honor. They are equal in, in importance. In the New Testament, Jesus is worshiped. But the Bible says that only God is to be worshipped. But Jesus is worshipped because he is fully God. And our Lord said in John 5, all are to honor the Son just as they honor the Father. And in that chapter, the Jews wanted to kill him because they said that he was making himself equal with God. So in his essential nature, the Son is equal to the Father. But in the plan of redemption, he is subordinate to the Father, and he submits to the Father's will. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 10. I have come to do your will, O God. 1 Corinthians 11 says that God is the head of Christ. So while the Son is fully equal with God, he's submissive to the Father. There's a relationship of authority and submission which has to do their, with their roles. And that difference in role and that difference in authority and submission in the role of redemption does not contradict in any way the equality of persons. Now, I emphasize this because you'll hear people say that submission always implies inferiority. Well, the relationship between the Father and the Son proves that false. And for us, that means in the, the, in the various relationships we have with, uh, with one another, with other people, differences in authority and submission to others does not indicate any difference in equality or worth. Uh, citizens are to be submissive to government employees to their employers, students to teachers, children to parents, wives to husbands. But there's no inferiority in these relationships any more than there is an uh, inferiority between the, the father and the son when the son is submissive to the father. So with this as uh, a key background for us, 
let's begin to look at some of our different roles. And I want to begin by asking you, what is your primary role as a Christian? What is your primary role as a Christian? And I'm not looking at some kind of general statement, our primary role is to glorify God. Uh, we all have different roles as Christians. And so what is your primary role in your Christian life? Now, I want you to look at uh, Romans chapter 1, and this time I'm serious about Romans 1, verses 14 and 15. Uh, and I'm not sure that I've heard many people make the point that I see in this verse. Romans chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Paul says, I am a debtor. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Now, Paul says that he is a debtor. Now, in the, in the passage, he's telling, us, telling them why he wants to come to Rome. And the reason he wanted to come to Rome is that he had a tremendous sense of obligation. It was a missionary obligation. This is what he owed. This was a debt he had to pay. He had to preach the gospel. Now, is that your debt? Is that your obligation? When I was young, all of the evangelists would use this verse to urge us to be witnesses to Christ. This is, was Paul's obligation. This was his debt. This is why he wanted to go to Rome to preach the gospel. But is that your obligation? Is that your debt? Now, let me be clear. We all have the obligation to preach the gospel, but is that our obligation or debt in the same way that it was for Paul? Where did Paul get this sense of obligation that he owed a debt to them? Where did he get that from? I would suggest that this sense of obligation for Paul came from his gift his spiritual gift, and his spiritual calling as an apostle. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. That is what God had called him to do at the time of his conversion on the road to Damascus. He was called to preach the gospel. He was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, that was Paul's calling. But is it yours? So when I look at this passage, I would ask, what is your spiritual gift? The fact is God has gifted you. Every believer has one or more spiritual gifts. He has gifted you. He has called you to serve him with your spiritual gift. And I would suggest that because of the way God has gifted you, he has called you, and you have an obligation a debt. Paul's obligation was to preach the gospel as the apostle to the Gentiles. That was his primary role. Your primary role, especially in, to, in the church, is to serve the Lord in the capacity that he has gifted you. That is your obligation. That is your debt. That is your role in the church. So what is my role that God has called me to do? That's a question that each of us is going to have to ask ourselves and answer. And your primary role is going to be determined by your spiritual gift. So this is going to be different for each of us. You are called to serve the Lord. You're called to be an active Christian. This is your obligation to the Lord and to others, this is one of your roles. Now we have other roles. And many of, the, many of these roles 
involve the principle of submission. We have those who are in authority over us and we need to be submissive in, uh, in our role. And here's where we need to look at the example of our savior. He did not balk at being submissive to God the Father. Now, do you like being submissive to other people? Some of you men, you may hold strongly to wives being submissive to their husbands and women being silent in the church, but are you willing to be submissive in areas where God says you are to be submissive? There are areas where men are to be submissive. Now, before I am specific on this, let me, let me say that I am not speaking here about the idea of mutual submission as it is taught by uh, feminists or egalitarians. Ephesians 5.1 says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, submitting to one another. Now, the next verse says that wives are to be submissive to their own husbands. Now, feminists take this verse uh, Ephesians 5.22, and they try to say on the basis of verse 21, submitting to one another, that not only are the wives to be submissive to their husbands, they say that husbands should also be submissive to their wives, submitting to one another. You like that? This is taking that verse out of context. The statement Submitting to one another in verse 21 introduces a, a, a following section, chapter 5, verses 22 to chapter 6 and verse 11, uh, verse 9, where we have three, three pairs of, of relationships where submission is involved. You have the first pair are wives and husbands, then you have children and parents, and then you have slaves and masters. Each one of these relationships involves submission. But in each, pair, in, in each pair, Paul is not saying that both sides should submit to each other. In each pair, it is only one side which is sub to submit to the other. Paul isn't telling parents to submit to their children, even though in some families that seems to be the way it works. He isn't telling masters to submit to their slaves. And he never says that husbands are to be submissive to their wives. But there are areas where men are to be submissive. One, in the church. Uh, in the church, men are to be in subjection to the elders. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Obey. Be in submission. Their role is to lead, and our role is to submit to them and to obey them. Now, that doesn't mean you have to agree with every decision of the elders, but it does mean that you yield and submit to them. When I was an elder, we would have good discussions in our elder meetings, and sometimes we disagreed. Sometimes we were disagreed strongly. But if I was in a minority, I submitted to the will to, wisdom of the majority. And this is the way the other elders acted. No one insisted on his own way. And I would call that leading by example in the church. That's the way all of us should act. Our role in the church, for most of us, both men and women, is to submit to the elders. Their role is to lead and oversee uh, the work of the, of the Lord in the church. So that's one area where men are to be submissive. I would say another area is, is in, in society. Uh, we are to be submissive to our governmental leaders. Romans 13, verses 1 and 2 says that... Uh, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. 
Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. This also, of course, does not mean that we have to agree with every rule and law of our government. In fact, our constitution gives us the right to openly express our disagreement and even to publicly protest. Not every society allows that. But the only actions of civil disobedience scripture allows is when we are forbidden by our government to do something God forbids or we are commanded to do something that God forbids or when we are forbidden to do something that God commands. When we're commanded to do something God forbids or when we're forbidden to do something God commands. And that's why Peter and the apostles responded to the Jewish leaders who were trying to forbid them to preach the gospel. We must obey God rather than men. Acts 5.29. Otherwise, we're to submit and to obey our authorities. That is one of our roles. One of the things I don't hear in our churches anymore that used to be so common, something that you would hear almost every week in our church meetings, and that is praying for our governmental leaders. When was the last time you heard someone in our churches pray for our president or for other leaders? Do you pray for President Biden? Or if you're a Democrat, did you pray for President Trump when he was president? Our society has become so polarized politically that it has affected many of us as Christians so that we're not willing to honor or be in subjection to those who are rightfully in authority over us because we don't agree with their politics. Scripture says, honor the king. The Roman emperor at that time was probably the cruel and godless Nero. So there are roles that men have, church, society, where we are to be submissive. And there are areas where women are to be submissive uh, in the home and in the church. Uh, The Bible gives different roles to men and women in the family and in the church. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says that the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the husband, and God is the head of Christ. And so this means that the wife is to be submissive to her husband. So the Bible does assign a role of leadership and authority to the husband and a role of submission to the wife. But now that doesn't give the husband the right to be authoritarian or demand that the wife comply with a a mousy subservience. Elders are to be obeyed and submitted to. But Peter says in 1 Peter 5 that uh, they are to serve the church and not lord it over those entrusted to you. Husbands, do not lord it over your wives. Now, I want to look at a verse in 1 Timothy 5.14 that speaks of the role of the wife in the home. And I think that this is a verse or a role that we often overlook. 1 Timothy 5.14. So here's what Paul says. I would... I would have younger women, widows to marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. Now, there's the, the word that I want us to particularly notice is that phrase that's translated, manage their households. The Greek word that is translated, manage their households, is the Greek word oikodespotein. And it actually comes from two Greek words. Oikos is the word for house. And the other word is the word despotes, from which we get the word despot. Dan Smith used to say that the wife 
is the despot of the house, the despot of the home. That statement of Paul that gives the wife great authority in the home. <clears throat> Do you remember the parable in Matthew 20 of the landowner who hired workers for his vineyard? He agreed to pay them a denarius for a day's work. <clears throat> and then he hired other laborers later on in the day and later on and later on. And they worked less time, but he still paid them the same. <clears throat> now, the word that is used for the landowner in the power, parable is the word that is used for the wife in the home. It is the word oikodespotes. He was the oikodespotes of the vineyard. She is the oikodespotes of the home. He was the despot of the vineyard. She is the despot of the home. That means she, had a, she has a great deal of responsibility in her own home, even though she has an authority who is over her. Now, how that, this is going to work out in your own home is going to be different for each of us. But I would look at the example of uh, someone who is the vice president in an organization. He's the vice president. He isn't the boss. He has someone over him to whom he has to submit, but he still is the vice president and he still has a great deal of authority. Wives have someone over them, but they still can have a great deal of authority and decision-making in the tone. She is the despot of the home. And that is one of her roles as wife. In the church, the Bible gives different roles to men and women. The women are to be silent, 1 Corinthians 11. They are not to teach, 1 Timothy 2. I take both of these passages to be referring to church situations. Women can teach. Older women are told to teach younger women in Titus 2. Priscilla and her husband took Apollos into their home and explained the way of God more accurately to him. Uh, Timothy was taught the scriptures by his mother and his grandmother. Women can teach, but not in the meeting of the church. Women can have all of the spiritual gifts men can have, except for the gift of apostleship. So women have a different role in the home and a different role in the church. But that doesn't mean that their role is insignificant in either case. Now, the issue of male leadership in the church and in the home has become a very acute and controversial one in the last couple of generations. And it isn't just in liberal churches that don't follow the Bible. In some evangelical churches and evangelical schools that say they believe the Bible, egalitarian or Christian, in, Christianism or Christian feminism has become very strong. And just by as an aside, that is not a mess that I'm talking about. Uh, parents are sending their children to well-known Christian schools without realizing that there are militant teachers in those schools that deny any difference in role between men and women in the home and in the church. So, uh, I only have time to mention two specific points that relate to this, but they are very important uh, for our understanding of, of scripture. First of all is the meaning of headship, the meaning of headship. It has become commonplace in many circles to say that the word head in, ver in, in the verse that says that the husband is the head of the wife Many people would say that that doesn't mean that the husband has authority over the wife. They do not take the word head to mean authority over. over. Uh, rather, 
you will hear it repeated over and over and over by feminists that the word head means source. The man is the head of the woman. The man is the source of the woman. And they will refer that back to the fact that in creation, God made the woman from the rib of the man. And it is said that the meaning source for head was a common meaning in ancient Greek. And further, it is said that the meaning authority over the over for the word head would not have been understood in the ancient world. So this is really an important issue that relates to the role of men and women, husbands and wives. We have a clear statement in 1 Corinthians 11.3 that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Or Ephesians 5.23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And what does that mean? Does head mean that the husband is the source of the wife? Or does it mean that the husband has authority over the wife, a leadership role? Now, to answer that, we shouldn't have to look beyond the Ephesians 5.23 passage to answer this, because Paul tells us in the very next verse what he means to say that the husband is the head of the wife. He says that just as the church is to submit to Christ because Christ is the head of the church, so the wife should submit to her husband because the husband is the head of the wife. The husband has a leadership role and the wife should, should uh, submit to her husband. But let me comment about the often repeated statement that source was a common meaning for the word head in Greek. Wayne Grudem uh, made a thorough investigation of the word head in ancient Greek writers from uh, 800 BC to 400 AD. He took a very large database and he actually looked up 2,000 336 examples where the word head was found in different Greek writers. Now you can imagine how long, uh, uh, how much time it would be involved in looking up that many examples, but that's what he did. Now, most of the time, the word head refers to the physical head and there's no question about the meaning, but when it is used figuratively, this is what Grudem found. He found 49 examples where the word means authority over. So the word head meaning of having to do with authority is not an uncommon meaning uh, in ancient Greek. Now, do you know how many times he found where the word head meant source? Zero. Zero. Not one single clear example where the word head means source. Now, this study was done a while ago, but his study still stands and it really has not been overthrown. So the word head does indicate that there is a different role between men and women uh, and in the church and in the home. And it has to do with authority and submission to authority. Now, the second, second point that I want to do, to, well, that I want to, to discuss that has to do with the roles of men and women is a statement that is made by feminists that the distinction of roles between men and women is something that is only the result of the fall. It is a result of sin, sin coming into the world. And so they will often refer to the verse in Genesis 3.16, where God is speaking to the woman and pronouncing his judgment because of sin. And he says, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So... In the passage, God is announcing judgment on the man, the woman, and the serpent because of sin. Feminists 
such as Gilbert Belazikian, who used to teach at Wheaton, said that the rule of Adam over Eve is viewed as satanic in origin, no less than death itself. Now, is that true? Is the woman submitting to her husband here in scripture just as the result of sin? This is where we need to look at the earlier chapters in Genesis. Genesis 2, God said in creating uh, man and woman, he says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And so Eve was created specifically to be Adam's helper. Uh, she was created to be his support. Uh, she was to be his aid, to help him in fulfilling the role that God had called him to do. She wasn't less important. She just had a different role. Eve was made for Adam, not Adam for, me, for Eve. That is specifically what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 11 and verse 9. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. And so her role was a supportive role, and his role was the primary role. Now, we do see in Genesis 3 and in the rest of Scripture that sin brought distortion of the right relationship and roles between men and women. But it did not introduce new roles. Now, after the fall, there is pain and suffering and tilling the ground, in childbirth and conflict and pain in the relationships between men and women. Through history, men have dominated women. And uh, through history, women have also tried to dominate men. But the New Testament reaffirms the original roles of creation between men and women. But now the sinful aspects have, that have been practiced through the human race, they are undone in Christ. Husbands are to love their wives like Christ loved the church, not dominate them. Wives are to submit to their husbands with the same attitude that Christ had when he submitted to God. Not to be rebellious, not to be domineering. So let me ask in conclusion, what is your role? Or should we say, what are the roles that God has given you? We live in a confused world today. My granddaughter was being pressured by some girls a year ago in middle school to uh, change her gender. And her response was, I'm glad that God made me a girl. I wouldn't want to be anything different than got what God has wanted me to be. And I think that's the response we should all have, whatever role we find that God has given us. Uh, different situations in our life, whether we are husband, wife, parent, child, employer, employee, citizen under government, Christian gifted to serve God in the church, whatever situation you find yourself in, it is God who has put you there. He has given you a task. He has given you a function. He has given you a role to fulfill, and you are to do it to the glory of God. Now, that's a high calling for each of us. And that is why there is a beauty in every God-given role. Let's look to the Lord. Lord, we do thank you for uh, what you have called us to do in various situations in our lives and the roles that you have given us. We do pray that as we look at our roles in different areas, that we would be able to say the same thing that our Lord Jesus said, I delight to do your will, O God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.